everybody, welcome. So good to see you again. Fred's going to open in prayer. Okay, right. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We, you know, we ask Holy Spirit you would come and uh, open our understanding and give us fresh revelation. Lord, thank you, Father, that your, your word is new every morning and so that you can give us fresh revelation. And so, yeah, so Holy Spirit, we say have your way and, and we just want to speak blessings yes. over all who are here watching the... Yeah. The, yes, the, bro the broadcast and yes, so Lord. we're going to say we love you Jesus and we just give you all the praise and the glory yes Lord amen amen, amen. Okay. right so we're into our fifth study already and um, last week we looked at the Holy Spirit we saw that he's a person that he has a mind emotions and a voice uh, we looked at the prophecies and um, what Jesus said about promising the Holy Spirit and Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And then we saw that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all believers for the first time at Pentecost. And the church was born. Mm -hmm. And then we saw that the reason this happens is because God is empowering us for ministry as his people. And um, the Holy Spirit's work, we looked at that. I think I forgot to mention that Jesus actually called him the helper. Yeah. And he helps us in, in everything we do for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the gifts that he brings with him when he comes. And then uh, we saw that Jesus was also empowered with the Holy Spirit before he started his ministry. And we said, how much more so do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So we've looked at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and now we're going to look at this, this word, the Trinity, because mm. we serve a Trinitarian God. Mm. Now you will never find the word Trinity in the Bible, but it is used to describe God's revelation of himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right, so in studying the Trinity, we must realize that because God is spirit and we are physical, it's not always easy for us to understand him. He is infinite, which means limitless, while we are finite. Okay, so infinite means boundless or limitless, and um, finite means bounded or limited. Yeah. So any concept that we express is limited in some way by the dimensions of space and time. These do not apply to God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you think about it, um, God is omnipresent, present everywhere all the time. We can only be present in one place at a time. And uh, God lives outside of time. He sees the end from the beginning. Yep while we are rooted in time and we we measure life by the passage of time so those the there's the two big differences so sometimes we find it very difficult to accept this concept of one god in three persons okay so we're going to look at what god shows us in his word so a careful study of scripture will show that while god is the one and only true god he exists or manifests himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This seems at first to be a contradiction, but the two ideas of oneness and Trinity must be held in relationship to each other. They are like the negative and positive poles of a battery. Without both poles, a battery won't function. So too, oneness and trinity are different aspects of God. Oh. Okay, other examples. Um, for instance, an egg, you get the yolk, you get the white, you get the shell, but it's still one egg. Water, you get ice, you get steam, you get the liquid, it's still water. Or a woman who is a daughter, a wife, and a mom, still one woman. So God reveals himself in three persons, but he's still one God. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 to 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul and with all your strength. I just, this, to, just to yeah. add in there that uh, the oneness and um, when the burning bush and then when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush and, and, and Moses said, who must I say sent me? Then God said, I am sent you, like singular, yeah. I am. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. So in Deuteronomy, um, Moses is teaching the Israelites or reminding the Israelites of who God is before they enter the promised land. And he's reminding them that we serve one, a God who is one. They came from Egypt where there were many deities. Mm -hmm. They're going into the promised land where there are people who serve many gods. Yeah. And he's teaching them, this is our God. Mm -hmm. um, here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, this is part of the Jewish confession of faith known as the Shema. Okay, so he's not saying lords, your gods. He's saying the Lord is, the Lord our God is one. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have their individual identities, but they can't be separated from each other in the common life they share. Mm. The work of any one of them always involves the person and work of the other two, as we will see. So we're going to look at biblical evidence of this. We're going to open our treasure chest and see what we can find. So the first um, scripture that we're going to today is Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. And we're going to be looking at the basis of the doctrine of the Trinity according to the baptism of Jesus. So Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17, please, lovey. Okay. The baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I, I need to baptize, uh, sorry, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Okay, so here we see the Trinity at work. Father speaking, Son receiving baptism, and the Spirit descending and alighting upon the Saviour. Okay, let's look at the baptismal formula. We're going now to Matthew 28, verse 19. So right at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, so here we've got Jesus giving the Great Commission, if I'm not mistaken, yep. um, just prior to his ascension. We're going to read from verse 16 to 19. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. It's called the Great Commission. Yeah. Then, they le then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, thanks, lovey. Okay, so Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Note, name is singular, indicating one God, not three. We're going to look now at the benediction. A benediction is a blessing that's uttered at the end of a service. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. That, so that's um, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And if you are following in your Bibles, pop a bookmark in there. We do come back to it. 
So this is Paul's final greeting to the Corinthians in his second letter to them. Okay, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So Paul recognized the role of each person of the Trinity. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus because of God's love and the Holy Spirit enables us to have fellowship with God and others. Okay, and then uh, we're going to look now at creation. Leave your bookmark into Corinthians. Let's move through to Genesis chapter 1. Okay, so Genesis chapter 1, we're reading verse 26 and 27. Looking at creation. Okay. Can I start? Uh, yes, you may. Okay. Then the Lord said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Okay, so going back to the uh, verse 26, let us make man in our own image. So the question arises, who on earth was God speaking to? Let's look now at Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And God said, Let there be light. Oops. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks, lovely, that's fine. And, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So we can see clearly that the Holy Spirit was there in the beginning with God. So we're going to look at, we're going to go. Freddie, have to we John. been in the Gospel of John yet this okay. morning? Okay, First so we're going to the Gospel of John. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 1. And um, if one you are following, you can put pop a bookmark in there. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just let me find that. Here we are. Um, John chapter 1, we're going to read verse, first verse 1 to 3. Then verse 14, and then we're going to look at verse 17 to 18. Okay. The Word becomes flesh, became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And verse 3. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that had been made. Okay. okay, verse 14. Verse 14. The Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 17 to 18. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen him, no one has ever seen God, but God the only Son, who is at the Father's at the sorry, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Okay, so we can see that Jesus was with God at creation in the beginning. The Holy Spirit was there, so it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all involved in the creation. Let's look at more examples of the Trinity acting in unity. First of all, in the Incarnation. Just to remind you, we are in the Gospel of John. We're going to look at John chapter 3, verse 16. Just to remind you that that word Incarnation means God becoming man. So John 3, verse 16, please, Fred. Okay, this is one that everyone should know. Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, so when the son came, the father gave him. Let's look at um, the son's birth in Luke 2, uh, verse 8 to 11. So we're in John, leave your bookmark there. Um, Luke 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So it's just before. Here we go. Luke chapter 2, reading verse 8 to 11. The shepherds and the angels and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them do not be afraid I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Okay, so in the town of David, a Saviour is born. The Father gives, the Son is born, and the Spirit causes conception. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, just, just a page back. Luke chapter 1, just verse 35. And we, we're looking at Mary's interaction with the angel. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay, so where the, the Holy Spirit is active, there's potential for miracles. And here we see the miracle of Jesus, of Mary conceiving Jesus, Amen. the Son of God. Amen. So the Father gives, the Son is born, and the Holy Spirit causes conception when it comes to the incarnation. We're looking now at salvation. We're going to go to Luke. We are in Luke, so we want chapter 15. Uh, reading verse 11 to 24. Uh, just let me get there first. So it's Luke 15. Oopsie. Yo, <laughs> I'm so lost. Okay, Luke 9, Luke 15. My little papers get lost and I get lost. Here we are. Okay, so it's Luke 15. Verse what? What are 11, we reading? 11 to 24. Verse eleven to twenty-four. Just let me get here. Okay. So just to say, um, you guys probably all know this that Jesus loved to tell parables to explain the things of heaven. And here he's talking about um, the prodigal son. He's explaining how the Father welcomes and forgives us when we turn to Him in salvation. Okay. Luke fifteen, verse eleven to twenty-four. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the, young, the younger son got together all he had, settled for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a, se a severe famine in the whole of the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed his pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Okay. So Jesus told this parable to demonstrate how happy the Father is to welcome and forgive repentant sinners. Uh, your Bible might refer to the lost son. Or it might refer to the prodigal son. Prodigal means recklessly wasteful. Okay, Jesus, uh, the father welcomes and forgives. Uh, the son seeks the lost sheep. We write in the very chapter we need to be, Luke 15. We're going to look at verse 1 to 7. The prodigal of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Okay, so um, we were thinking, remember, before the lockdown, we were constantly singing that song in worship about leaving the 99, and neither Fred nor I could remember how the song goes, so he can't sing it for you right now. But, um, um, so, so Jesus made it clear that he's come to look for the lost sheep, and in John 10 verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Yep. Um, so he not only came to seek the sheep, he lays the, or laid down his life for them as well. And then the Spirit seals the convert. Um, leave your bookmark in Luke. We're going to Ephesians now, a scripture that we looked at last week, but I think it's fitting to remind ourselves of this one. Uh, um, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter... One. Chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Okay, so when it comes to salvation, the Father welcomes and forgives. Jesus seeks the lost sheep and lays down His life for them. And the Spirit comes and seals the convert as a guarantee of what is to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, we're going to look now at prayer. Right, we're going back to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Um, Darling, could you pass me one of those little papers? I just need something to keep my eye on the right line here. Thank you. Okay, John chapter 16, verse 19 to 24. Is that right, Fred? Yep. Okay, let me just find that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, here we are back in John chapter 16 this time. Right, reading from verse 19 to 24. Uh, are we in the right yeah. place? <laughs> yep. Right, John 16, verse 19 to 24. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn, 
while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because a time has come. But when a baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of a joy that the child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time to grieve, but I will see you again, and I will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Okay, so yeah, Jesus is um, interacting with his disciples. I think they're at the Last Supper. And um, Jesus indicates that the Father receives and grants our requests. And then he also goes on to begin to teach them to pray in his name. Mm. So we pray in Jesus' name. And then he also intercedes on our behalf. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 to 25. Just hold your horses before you start reading, please, friend. Hebrews 7, 23 to 25. Okay. So just an explanation of how things worked under the old covenant. People lived according to the law and you would approach God through the high priest. You couldn't go straight to God. You had to go through the high priest. So you would bring your animal for sacrifice, um, a sin offering to be sacrificed and the, the high priest would do the sacrifice and would intercede to God on your behalf so that your sins would be forgiven. Um, so under the new covenant, Jesus steps into that role of the high priest. So let's first read this, Hebrews 7, verse 23 to 24. Now there were many of those priests, since death prevented them from continuing to continue in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he lives, because he always lives to intercede for them. Okay, so the point we're making is that the Father receives requests, we pray in Jesus' name, and he intercedes on our behalf. Under the new covenant, Jesus steps into the role of the high priest, he became the sacrifice, hmm. and he is at the Father's right hand interceding for us. Okay, and then the Spirit assists us in prayer. So it's Romans 8, 26 to 27, another one that we looked at last week. Um, Romans 8. Hang on a minute. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts Romans. <laughs> Acts Romans. Here we are. Romans, what did I say? 8, verse 26 to 27. Okay. Okay. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know wh what... Sorry. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's God. will. Okay, so the Spirit directs and interprets our prayers, helping us to pray according to the Father's will. Um, take note, we've just looked at the fact that Jesus intercedes for us in heaven, and yet mentions the Spirit interceding for us as well. So the Spirit intercedes for us here on earth, within us, and Jesus intercedes for us at the Father's side. We're going to look now at the, at the Trinity and the attributes of God and see how this works. So all the characteristics of the Father seen in our first study also apply to the Son and the Spirit. 
Mm-hmm. Firstly, the fact that God is eternal, that I think that was probably the first thing we looked at. Yeah. We looked at Psalm 90 verse 2, and that just says, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. We're not going to go there now. We're going to Revelation chapter 1, um, verse 9 to 18. So Revelation, last book of the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 9 to 18. And here we have um, John's Revelation. Are you there, darling? Yep. The Revelation that John was given on the island of Patmos. So Revelations 1, verse 9 to 18. One like the Son of Man. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit and I heard it behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus Samaria Smyrna Smyrna <laughs> Pega Mum Tos Tyatira Tyatira Sardis Philadelphia and Laodicea I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all his brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Okay, thanks, Lavi. Um, right, so we're looking at the fact that Jesus is also eternal, and he says, yeah, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Okay, so we know that Jesus in obeying God completely, won back the authority that Satan had stolen. And now instead of death, he can give you life. Mm. So I think it's um, every reason to come to Jesus. He holds those keys of authority over death. Um, Right, so the one who was dead and is now alive forever and ever is Jesus. And here was John. Um, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who spent so much time with him, who recognizes Jesus in his glorified state. Just to read you the notes from my uh, Life Application Bible, it says, um, having lived with him for three years during his preaching ministry and having seen him glorified at the transfiguration, John, the writer of Revelation, recognized him. He says, one like the Son of Man, and they call Jesus the Son of Man. Mm. Um, And then it said, notice the golden sash around his chest reveals him as the high priest who goes into the Father's presence to obtain forgiveness of sin for those who believe in him. Mm. So for me, that's also exciting. It confirms everything that we believe about Jesus. Okay, and then... So Jesus is eternal, the Father is eternal, and God the Holy Spirit. We're reading uh, Hebrews again, this time verse 13 to 14. Is that what you've got, Lavi? I've got 9, 14. Okay, go. 9, 13 to 14. So it's Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, 
Hebrews. Okay, Fred, give us an indication of where Hebrews is, please. <laughs> For those of us that are battling. It's before the book of James Timothy. or after the book of James, somewhere near the book of James. Okay, Hebrews um, chapter, what did we say? Nine. Verse 13 40. to 14. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offer himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve a living God? Okay, so just to point out that scripture refers to the eternal spirit. Um, and we know he was at creation anyway. We, we verified that first. Yeah. Right, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three eternal. They are also all three all powerful. We're not going to look at any of the scriptures on your sheet. They all refer to power. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all powerful. Uh, we are going to our third point on your sheet, which is, which is the fact that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all-knowing, omniscient. We will look first at God the Father, Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah in your Old Testament. Um, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 to 10. Seventeen. Yeah. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 to 10. Okay. The heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. Okay. So we're homing in on the Lord, uh, I the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. We're going to move back to Revelation now, chapter 2, um, verses 18 to 26. And this is one of those mind-blowing passages, but we look at the difficult things as well. We can't ignore them. So it's Revelation 2, uh, verse 18 to 26. Um, just to say we are back in um, Jesus' interaction and what he's saying to John. Uh, to the church in Tarotia. To the, to the angel of the church in Tarotia write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, but her teaching, by her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, verse 23. Okay, so with this being a difficult passage, I want to explain a few things first, just to draw your attention to our very first study again, when we spoke about God's wrath against sin, and uh, we said God gets super angry when we willfully sin. 
And here in verse 21, we can see G, um, Jesus was having a hard time with this woman who called herself Jezebel. Okay, verse 21, he says, I have given her time to repent of her immoral immorality. Okay, shows he's given her time, he's been patient, but she is unwilling. Okay, so she's made the choice. Hmm. She's unwilling to repent. So what's going to happen? Justice must take its course hmm. and judgment will come. And we can see the judgment mentioned here is not very pleasant. So because God is just, he must judge sin. But his will is that we repent so that our judgment falls on Jesus. We Amen. need to repent so that our judgment falls on Jesus. Okay, so the actual point that we're making here is verse 23. I am he who searches hearts and minds. So we see that God the Father searches hearts and minds. Mm. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows what we are thinking. So does Jesus. Okay, so let's move on to God the Holy Spirit. Oh, um, Freddie, where are we? Let's go to 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians, okay, just let me find it, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 to 10. Yep. Here we go. Okay. Yes. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So if the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, He knows our hearts, He knows our minds. Okay, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, all omniscient. Okay, and then um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all holy. And I don't think we need to look at these passages tonight. You'll have them on your sheet. Um, um, the first um, scripture we would have looked at is Isaiah 6, and it says, The seraphs call to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Acts 3 tells us, uh, Paul refers to Jesus as being the holy and righteous one. And then Acts 1 tells us, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I don't think I need to prove that to you. Yeah. Okay. And then God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all true, Scripture tells us. So John 17, are we coming back? Oh, yeah. we've already moved off Revelation. No, 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 no. We are coming back there in a minute. Okay, yeah. God the Father, John 17, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Find my bookmark. John 17, verse 1 to 5. Jesus prays for himself. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And four. Um, till five, please, lovey. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And verse five. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Okay, so Jesus calls God the only true God. And take note how he confirms that he was with with God in the beginning. Yeah, I yeah. think that's so exciting and fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then um, we're going, we're coming back to, to John 14 in a minute. So leave your bookmark here, we'll find chapter 14 easily. We're going back to Revelation, this time chapter three, uh, verse seven. Revelation three, verse seven. Uh, 
Jesus speaking to the church in Philadelphia to the church to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these are the words of him who is holy and true he holds the key of David what he opens no one can shut and what he shuts no one can open Okay, so Jesus referred to God the Father as being the only true God and now he calls himself holy and true. Um, and he refers to the key of David um, and his authority to open or close doors, okay, to the kingdom of God or eternal life really. He is the Davidic Messiah, holds the key of David, is of David's line. And that was what the Israelites were watching out for. Unfortunately, some of them missed him. Okay, so keys in general represent authority. Um, as in Revelation 1 verse 18 that we looked at earlier, um, where he refers to the keys of death and Hades. So he has the authority. And then in John 14 that we're not going to look at, verse 6, uh, Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm. So let's look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit in John 14, verse 15 to 18. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will obey my, what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay, so, that, so there Jesus refers to the spirit of truth. And notice in verse 17 and 18 he says, He lives with you and will be in you. And then he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, Father, Son, and yeah. Holy Spirit, one God. Mm. Right. So the Trinity is united in diversity. Each person has a different role and function, yet is perfectly united. God's church should really reflect this. Mm. Each one putting the other's needs above their own. Someone once described Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being so in love with each other that they always want the very best for each other. So we really serve a God of relationships, not so. And then I recall Pastor Tim in one of his recent sermons referring to um, the dance of the Trinity that I think he referred to a book by Alexander Fenter, the dance of the Trinity. So in closing, it must be emphasized that the Trinity remains a mystery and that no single illustration can possibly explain everything. However, the Christian church firmly believes that there is one God, eternally existing and revealing himself to us in three persons. It is only through God's revelation of himself that we can know anything at all about him, and that's why the Bible is our reference. So the, the Trinity exists whether we understand and accept it or not, okay? God can't be intellectualized, nor is he limited to our understanding. Um, as Christians, we accept what he chooses to reveal about himself in faith, okay? So we refer to our Trinitarian God as he, not they. And let me also throw this in here. We do not call him she. We do not serve a she God. God is a he. She comes from New Age movements and feminist movements. And if you came into my Bible study with one of your gender neutral Bibles, I would welcome you dearly. But I would ask you to please read from the real Bible. Okay. Yeah. So um, I just want to make that point. Um, and we were right so the and then just to ma finally to to just remind you or, or make the point that the trinity is yet another major doctrine yeah. of the christian church yeah. cults will yeah 
deny the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be like a force or yeah. influence or something. Yeah. 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 So it is mind boggling, but this is what God shows us about Himself. So we accept that in faith. Just to recap on that point about God not being a she, Jesus came from heaven to reveal what God is like, to show us what God is like. And he had this relation gain with God the Father, Abba Father, he called him. Mm. Not she or mommy or anything like that. Abba Father. Yeah. Okay, Fred, anything else? No, that's sorted. Sorted. Okay. okay. So next week we are going to start the studies on Easter. We're going to do that over two weeks. Very exciting. Please join us. Are oh, you going to close in prayer, darling? Yeah, okay. Quick prayer. So, Father, we just thank you and we, we bless you for your word. And, and yeah, Lord, we, we need your Holy Spirit to, uh, your counselor, your helper, so we can just absorb what you're saying. Thank you, Father, that your word is alive and active. And we bless you. And, Father, we just pray that, yeah, until we meet again next week, we give you all the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.